messages. And, and so I want to invite my brother Doug Clark up here, and he's going to, uh, again, share, share the word with us. And, and I just want you guys to give him just a, a big round of applause just for, for being here and taking the time to be here with us. Uh, we're super excited, brother. God bless you, and I'm excited to hear what you have for us. Thanks, buddy. Wow, thanks, Romeo. It's great to be here this morning. Great to be back. I enjoyed my time with you guys. I think that was in June, wasn't it? That uh, we had, That's when Father's Day is, so it's got to be somewhere near that, right? We're not going to do it in May when it's Mother's Day. I mean, go figure that out, right? Yeah, I'm a bright one. You'll catch on to that real quick. So these two guys, they were best friends. I mean, best friends. They just they had everything in common. They just loved hanging out. I mean, there's so much they loved about each other. One was black and one was white, and they just, man, they just, just loved life. And, but there's one thing that kept getting in the way of their friendship. Huge, huge argument. I mean, they would just fight about this thing. And uh, their argument was the white guy was certain that God was white. Right? <laughs> the black friend was certain. Some of you guys are going, oh my goodness, he's going race on us. We don't even know this guy. Just hang with me. You're going to love me in a second. The black guy was just certain that God was black. I mean, they seriously would argue about this. Well, as fate would happen, they both died on the very same day. Got to heaven, and there's St. Peter at the gate. He said, who are you? They gave their names. They said, hey, 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 St. Peter, maybe you can solve this. What's up? How can I help you? Well, man, we're the best of friends, but we just always argued about this one thing. I think God's black. He thinks God, God's white. Which is it? Peter looks around and goes, Lucky you. This is your day. Here, here he comes now. You can ask him. God walks up and says, Buenos dias, amigos. Como esta todo? Bienvenido a mi cielo. <laughs> right? Come on. Así es la vida, ¿no? El lenguaje de los cielos. Vamos a hablar español cuando llegamos ahí, ¿no? Okay, for those of you that are uneducated, <laughs> amen. So I heard about this pastor who just loved to golf. Oh my goodness, he was just passionate about golf. Sometimes it caused him to do some things he shouldn't do. And one day he just, man, he just wanted to golf bad. And so on a Sunday morning he called and he told the guest speaker, hey, I'm not going to be at service today. I'm, I got to go. I, I just can't go. He didn't tell why. And the guest speaker said, fine, no problem, I'll come, I, I, can, I can fill in for you. And, and uh, so the pastor then snuck off to the Del Webb community over in Florence. Took his sticks, you know, and teed up at the first hole, 420-yard par 4. And he wasn't real confident with his driver, but he pulled it out anyway. Those of you golfers understand the nuance of challenges of using a driver. Pulled that thing out and swung as hard as he could. And all of a sudden, God came with his wind and just lifted this ball up and just carried it 420 yards. It landed on the green and rolled into the cup. Angel leaned over to God and said, What'd you do that for? And God said, Well, who's he going to tell? Well, I can honestly tell you, Pastor Jerry is not on the golf course. But he does need the wind of God's presence in his life. He needs his strength, needs his healing touch. I know you're praying for him. I know you love him. He's a good man. And uh, follow the directions that Luann laid out. That uh, Hey, just, just love him from a distance right now. Don't tax him with any, anything other than love. And, and even then, maybe save those love affirmations for when he gets back so he can really get some rest. Hope. Hope is such an intriguing and yet seemingly elusive thing. Maybe you remember when you were a little kid. What do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, I hope I'm a fireman. Oh, I want to be an astronaut. I'm going to be a teacher. Oh, I'm, I'm going to be a nurse. I mean, with certainty, those hopes were declared and... Contrast that to, to us as adults as, as we get older. And so, so, so what are you going to do when you graduate? Well, you know, I'm not sure. I was hoping that maybe I could go do that, but who knows? And, 
and I'm not sure if my major's going to work, and, and then I've just lost my job, so I hope it all works out. And, and, and something shifts. Something happens. Or, or take, take pictures of little kids. I have pictures of my, of my two boys above my desk, and as they, as they played as little boys in the sand, I mean, there's just this gleeful certainty about life. They, they were carefree. There was a sparkle in their eyes. They were hopeful. Contrast that often to pictures of adults, and while, yes, we've learned to put a smile on our face, if you look closely, there's often a, a shadow of doubt, possibly a touch of hurt, maybe even a hint of disappointment. Why is that? What happens? Well, as life progresses, we lose hope. There was a time in my life when I, I lost hope. I wrote about it as Pastor Romeo remarked in my book called Overcoming My Perfect Storm. And using metrics that, were, that is common to most, I was on top of the world. Man, I had an intact family, wife and two beautiful boys. My reputation was stellar. I was a state legislator here in the state of Arizona. I was a president of the Chamber of Commerce. I was a president of the Arts Council in North Valley. I was the soccer coach at our local high school. I mean, I, I was just, I was a, had a great reputation. I was a leader in our community. Healthy? Buddy, I was healthy. Physically, I could run forever. I could lift forever. I could jump all over the place. I could outrun my soccer players. They used to hate it. This old man could beat them. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, strong, healthy. Strong net worth. Plenty of zeros behind my bank account numbers. My income was solid. Had a house, beautiful cars, Lincoln Navigator, Lincoln Aviator. Used to vacation wherever I wanted to vacation. It's a beautiful life. And then the storm hit. First, my finances crashed. We went from dreaming about where we were going to vacation to wondering how we were going to pay the mortgage. Within time, we lost our house, lost our vehicles, downgraded to a Honda 49cc scooter. You just picture that. Eventually declared bankruptcy. My reputation was shattered when I took a stand in our community that was less than popular, as our pastor was accused of embezzling funds. And I felt led to come alongside him, and I said, Pastor, I'm with you as you go through this hard time. I lived in a small community. Little I know that that... That decision, that commitment, would be a life-impacting commitment as people decided ahead of time whether he was guilty or whether he was innocent. And since I stood up for him, I surely must be complicit, and I too was guilty. Shortly, those roles of leadership that I had enjoyed melted away. Vote of no confidence, Chamber of Commerce. President of North Cal uh, uh, the Arts Valley of, uh, of the North Valley, uh, th that role was rescinded. Parents yelling expletives from the stands at me as I coached my team on the sidelines. It was not easy time. Physically, my health deteriorated to where I had four different surgeries, so much so that I became friends with the surgeon and put a post on my tummy and said, hey, be careful. That backfired when I woke up and he said, I can't find my cell phone. Just kidding. Get it? All right. My family disintegrated, and what were first cracks became canyons and suffered a terrible divorce. It's not what God wants in any marriage. As time progressed, my mental and emotional and spiritual health began to deteriorate. As I considered how shame-filled my life had become and how embarrassed I was to be seen in public. I'd go into the grocery store and wish I could get in and out with people seeing me because on one row people would be cussing at me because I'd made this stand and on the other row they'd laugh at me because I was nothing compared to what I had been in their eyes. Although an extrovert in the life of the party, an inner, but I was an energizer bunny. I mean, I was the guy. I was party in a box. But I found that I began to withdraw from others and from God, I began to isolate myself. I find myself in a corner in Phoenix, Arizona, sobbing, contemplating stepping off into traffic. 
I felt hopeless, helpless, ready to give up. Researcher Dr. Martin Seligman did a study on helplessness. If you please forgive the harsh way he did this study, but watch what he found. He took two dogs, put them in separate kennels, connected them to electrodes that could shock them on a regular basis. And in one kennel that he put one dog, there was a way this dog, if he could figure it out, could be relieved of the shocks. In the other kennel, he gave no such safety measure. And so the dogs were placed in the kennel with these electrodes and these jolts started happening. And you can just imagine the upsetting nature of these electric jolts. The one dog who had a way of finding relief quickly found the lever and pulled on it. And the electric shots ended and he was, oh, he was just loving life. The other dog that did not have a lever continued to experience these painful electric shocks. Dr. Seligman then did a part two of this study and, he, and he, of this research and he took both dogs and he put them in brand new kennels. Only this time in both kennels he had a way in, mo in which both dogs could find relief. The electric shocks began and the one dog who had known the, the system before quickly found relief and the electric shock subsided. The other one who had helplessly curled up in the corner of his kennel because he couldn't find a solution on this part two of the research didn't even try. He just quickly gave up and curled up in the corner of his kennel and he surrendered. The second dog succumbed to helplessness. And at, in essence that's what I had done. I curled up in a ball in the corner of my world because I felt helpless to stop the shocks. I knew I needed help, and with what seemed to be my last gasp, I reached out on that street corner in Phoenix, Arizona. And it was during this low time in my life that God began reminding me of powerful life truths that we find in His Word. Among those life truths is what we're going to talk about today, and the life truth that there is power in hope. Unfortunately, for most of us, hope has become more of a wishful thinking scenario. I hope I get a car. Oh, I hope I get a raise. I hope we have a baby boy. Even Webster's in its definition of hope, I believe, gets it wrong when it says hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. Hmm. With that definition, you could see how someone could easily lose hope when someone just feels that their current situation can't change. Viktor Frankl, you may have heard of him, a renowned author, studied those who did not survive World War II. Why is it when given the same meager amount of food the lack of hygiene, the minimal sleep, the deplorable living conditions, and the mistreatment. Why did some survive and some didn't? He concluded that it was because they couldn't see that anything would ever change. Thus they felt that their existence didn't have any meaning. They gave up because they lost hope. And to be honest with you, that's where I found myself. I wanted to give up because I had lost hope. But please don't get me wrong, I didn't think my circumstances were anything close to theirs, but my perception of my existence was similar, and that I had lost hope that anything would ever change. But listen to this. I love this. Listen closely. This is, this is rich. Frankel concluded the following. Listen closely. I'm going to read exactly word for what he said. He said, Frankel concluded, hope is the effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself, and it is the byproduct of one's surrender to a person other than oneself. Oh, is that rich with irony? 
I mean, so in other words, he rediscovered what God had already declared. When we connect with and commit to something and someone greater than ourselves, helplessness, helplessness cannot escape, cannot escalate to hopelessness. That's crucial. That is key. That's the hope that the Bible speaks of. When in Romans 15, 13 it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the hope that God offers us today. Not just wishful thinking, not just a desire. Jeremiah 29, 11, one of my favorite verses says, for, the, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Hope is a certainty. Hope is, hope is an assurance. Hope is confidence. And that is the hope that God offered me on that corner in Phoenix, Arizona. And, and at that moment, I took some concrete, measurable steps of both commitment and connection. First, in, in my connection and, and commitment with God, I, I kind of, I agreed with the psalmist where in 20, uh, Psalms 89, 49, he says, Oh Lord, where is the love you've always shown me and you promised so faithfully to me? I mean, that's just, it's a sanitized little verse. We sometimes read it without any vision or passion. But if you identify it, hey, hey God, where is that love you promised me, huh? Where is it? Where did it go? I told God how I felt. I actually yelled at him. I probably said some words that you'd be embarrassed to hear. I told him it wasn't fair. I had me a good old pity party. You ever had one of those? I had what I call a Nancy Kerrigan. Remember Nancy Kerrigan? Some of you my age, you younger guys going, Nancy who? Nancy Pelosi, who is this? Nancy Kerrigan was an Olympic skater, just beautiful skater. I mean, she was just artistic. Just, she expressed herself on ice and like nobody's business. She had an art rival who maybe didn't seem as graceful, Tanya Harding. Remember that competition? I mean, they were just always, and I'm not saying that the Miss Kerrigan was perfect, but I can tell you this, Tanya made a mistake. She hired a couple guys who took some batons and after one performance, grabbed Nancy and started banging on her leg so they could injure her so she couldn't skate. Remember that? Do you remember the video of that when, when they sh captured it on film and, and there was Nancy laying, laying kind of half on the ice, half off the ice, and she had just getting, been knocked on her lower legs, and, and she goes, Why? Why me? Do you remember that? I mean, she just cried, and you could put yourself, you're going, yeah, why you? Why would anybody do that? Why? Why me? Well, well I, did a, I did a Nancy Kerrigan. Why? God, why me? Can't you pick on someone else? I mean, is that fair that I wouldn't want that to happen? No, God, why me? And although my pleadings were with a victim mentality, I actually benefited from confessing how I felt. You know why? God already knew. He's waiting for me to admit it. Waiting for me to confess it. We can act like everything's fine. And God says, well, I can't do anything for you until you admit that everything's not fine. And so even if you come to him and say, God, why me? And that's what I did. And then I recommitted to him. Now, I had never consciously nor publicly uncommitted. But through my actions and my attitudes, I withdrawn in my relationship with him when I isolated and withdrew and let that shame come on because I thought everything was measured on those things that I told you about. Your family, your health, your income, your reputation. See, I kind of skewed my values a little bit, hadn't I? So I had kind of slipped away from his value system. And I said, okay... God, obviously, I'm at the end of my rope. I, I want to die, quite honestly. In fact, I'll help you if you want to bring me home. And I shifted from that and I said, God, 
I need your love. You see me? You see, you see me a broken man. I, I, got, I got nothing left. I used to think I was on top of the world. There's nothing I couldn't do. I used to tell people that. I didn't do anything. Trouble is, I actually really thought I was perfect. I joked about it, but I actually really thought it. God had to get to me to a place. Where I was humbled. I said, God, help. Second thing I did is I took measurable steps in my connection with and commitment to others. Like I said, I'd isolated myself. I used to be in the mix. I love people. As you, I just love. I love connecting. I just, but I'd pulled away, you know, because I was so embarrassed. My pride. Instead of withdrawing from everyone and everything, I realized I needed to connect. I needed to engage. And so, so what did I do? I started reaching out to, and I had coffee with friends. And these are people who've been asking me to come. And I go, no, no, I can't. You know, give all kinds of excuses and could just hide in my room, curl up my bed because I was wishing life would end. And finally, I'd reach out, hey, want to have coffee? And they go, well, who's this? They forgot who I was. And we'd have coffee. No agenda. I didn't, I didn't sit there and just bleh. You know, I just sat there and kind of like hoped I'd be accepted. And, and hope they wouldn't ask any personal questions at first because I just, I just wanted to start re-engaging and reconnecting. And I, then I, I got a little braver and I joined a hiking group. I love doing outside. I love outdoor stuff. So I joined this hiking group. That was a challenge because, believe it or not, although I come up here and I do this, I'm a, I'm a private person. And you get on these trails and these chatty Cathy's, and you, excuse me, I'm going to be sexist, but some of you ladies, oh. It's like... Zip, would you? I mean, we'd be walking along and what about you? What about you? What about you? And go, whoa, 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 lady, I just want to hike. You know, and unfortunately, every once in a while, the trail would go to single track, so they're forced to go in front or behind so that they'd have to talk to somebody else. I go, whoa, whoa, good, a little quiet here. Joking, obviously. Okay, maybe not. Yeah. Anyway, so, so with time, with time, I began to interact with, with the guys and the girls in those hiking groups. And I, I started hearing that they too had stories and they, they too could relate. And yes, yeah, some were believers, some weren't, but just that life experience, the ups and downs and the challenges and, and, and all the rest. And, and so then I, I said, whoa, maybe I'll schedule a golf outing. Well, I've always called golf my therapy. Oh, man, there's nothing for me. There's nothing like stepping on a tee and just smelling that fresh-cut grass and seeing the beautiful water out there and watching the birds fly across and the cotton candy clouds float by and seeing all the wildlife and just getting that thing and just swinging and wherever it went. You know, I was not an angry golfer. I just, I just, that was my therapy. I get, wherever that ball went, that, it's okay, because then I get to see more. It's just, the, like, who cares? I mean, granted, I wanted to do well, but still, you've seen the golfer. <laughs> well, I'd withdrawn from even doing that, and I, I called up my buddy, who we used to go every week. He's a golf pro up in Phoenix, and I said, hey, dude, I'm going to go off on you. Who's this? We went out, and I didn't tell him what was going on. He knew something because I'd withdrawn, and we were golfing. And, and so after, after a few weeks of, of re-engaging, I started kind of getting brave and sharing with him. He was a believer and say, just, you know, hey, you know, this is what I'm going through. And it, it became such a, a seriously good therapy time, and not just with nature, but as he spoke God's goodness into my heart and, and helped me begin to realign uh, God's values in my heart. And check this out. I actually started going to church again, right? I mean, let me give you some context. When I grew up, so my parents were missionaries, so that makes me a missionary kid. Okay, you've met many of us. Most of us are brats, okay? I was a brat. Still can be at times. But I grew up going to church five times a week at minimum, okay? Okay. I mean, even you parents are going, I'd never make my kid do that. And you kids would go, I would never do that. I mean, five times a week. So you you got to believe, by the time I came adult, I said, you know, my quota, been there, done that. I've done enough church service for a lifetime. I think I'm good. I'm going, I've heard every sermon backwards, forwards, inside out, back, you know, upside down. 
I started going back. And I didn't want to be there, really. I'd sit in the back, and I think people knew I didn't want to be there, so they weren't incredibly friendly to me. You know, they could probably just sense it. Whoa, careful, he bites, stay away. <laughs> and I'd, I'd sneak out before the service is over because I'm going, oh, sh you know, whatever. But something kept drawing me, right? So I kept going back, and, and little by little, I started actually looking forward to connecting with those people who I was meeting in church. And slowly but surely, they actually became more friendly, go figure. As I became more open, they became more friendly, and pretty soon some great bonds of friendship and support began to develop. And then, check this out. I went and volunteered at a non-profit. Stop. Here's this ex-millionaire, ex-state legislator who used to shake hands with the President of the United States in the basement of the building, folding letters and stuffing envelopes so that some people over in Kenya could have food. Now, these people, this nonprofit, had no idea anything about my background. I just, I just, I just knew that was what I needed. I needed to start giving of myself because that was part of that step back to health, back to wholeness. And, and I'd go, and, and I don't know if they could tell that I was just on edge, that I was a broken vessel, that I was just as easy to fall apart as to walk out whole. But, but, but as time went by, I, I started connecting with them. I started bringing in cookies so that we could talk instead of just stuffing envelopes because I, 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 I started realizing I needed that relationship. And, and then I brought in frozen yogurt. You know, anything so stop, and we'd have to eat. And if we have to stop and eat, then we can talk. And if we can talk, then that emptiness inside, that loss of connection, could maybe start getting filled up again. And it was just, a, it was just an amazing time as I, I started seeing their heart. Instead of selfishly looking at my situation, I was like, here's some incredible people giving themselves for stub. I mean, their, their pay is just like nothing. And yet with such huge hearts were giving of their lives. And I committed to seeing a counselor. The opportunity to be transparent learning how to be vulnerable, appreciating accountability, such a huge help my counselors were to me. And as I did this, I began experiencing a heart shift, and instead of asking why me in a whiny, this isn't fair to me tone of voice, I started asking humbly, Why, God? What? What? What are you? What do you? What do you want to teach me? What? Do you, what? What can I learn from this? And instead of feeling hopeless, I began to stand on the certainty, on the hope on the assurance that God was at work in my life. That He would never let me down. That He would see me through. And it's my pleasure to stand before you today and testify that there is power in the hope that God offers us this morning. So what's your current status? Are you curled up in the corner of your kennel like that dog that didn't even try to find the solution the second time around? Are you locked inside a mental, spiritual, or emotional prison? Are you on a street corner about to step into traffic? Was it tough for you to raise your hand when Pastor, Pastor Romeo said, isn't God good and isn't everything great? And, you're, oh. and finally, the third time, you go, okay, whatever. He's not going to give up. I better set, raise my hand. Was that, is that you? Is it hard for you to admit that? Is life not going the way you'd expected, the way you had hoped in your wishful thinking as you approached it? Can I gently, lovingly, humbly, yet boldly invite you to find that someone and that something larger than yourself to connect with and to commit to? 
There are two ways you can connect and commit which will remove the sense of helplessness and foster hope inside of your heart. We all yearn for that. Even those of us go, yeah, everything's great inside. We're going, oh man, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Two things that can help foster that. Let me, let me express one of them to you and the second one, which is actually more important, I'll express second. The first one is connect with others. Such a simple little lever in our kennel of life but oftentimes, like that dog, that all he had to do was look, and there's a solution. I'm handing you a simple solution that we could go and curl away, but I invite you, press the button, pull the lever, connect with others. God intends for us to live in community. He likens us to, in Scripture to a body that's for a reason. He knows how we function best. He knows how wholeness can come about in our life. And it's when we're in community with others. Can I suggest a short list, just practical ways that you can start connecting today? Sometimes we forget these. Just allow me. This is simple stuff. But if you're down here at the bottom of your barrel like was, you're going, this is going to be a life. And you go, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do that. Listen carefully. Number one, Friendships. Maybe reach out to those people that have been reaching out to you. And don't vomit all your stuff on them. Just, just accept their friendship and their invitation to do something simple. Or, or maybe reach out and be proactive. Invite them to something simple. And, and just enjoy life. And maybe with time, they'd be the person you tell your cares to. Maybe not. Maybe they can't handle it. Maybe they don't have the wisdom that God wants to be. But just start fostering friendships. Number two, food. Oh, okay, never mind. Amen. Food. Do you find yourself dining alone as I was? I mean, I would just, you know, sit there and whatever, whatever. Call someone up and say, hey, I, got, I have just about enough for two if you don't eat too much. Come on over. <laughs> or when friends invite you over, go enjoy their food. Just don't eat all of it, but just enjoy some of their food. And, 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 and over that, start enjoying the goodness of God. What about fun? It's okay to be fun as Christians. What do you enjoy doing? Take, take baby steps. I understand I'm talking really boldly like this is easy, but when you're in the bottom of the barrel, it's not easy to do. Just take baby steps. Whatever it is you enjoy to do that's fun, and then invite someone to come along. Join. Join a meetup or some kind of social club. That's what I did with hiking. I went online, meetup, and they went, I went hiking. I didn't know these people from Adam, but guess what? They want to belong just as badly as you want to belong. They're looking for relationship. They're looking for connection just as much as you are. So as you go and make yourself vulnerable just in a small way of saying, yeah, let's hike. Yeah, let's go bowling. Just little things. Let's go biking. Let's go golfing. Find a cause. Volunteer at a nonprofit like that. I mean, nothing will change your heart like that. Go to church. Just be ready. They're just as imperfect as you are. We don't all have it together, do we? Even Pastor Jerry's laying in his bed right now going, Why, God? He didn't have all the answers. He got a lot of them. He didn't have all the answers. So be ready for that. And that's the beauty of it. I'm in a community here right now that I know you, like I, go, I don't know all the answers but God. Right? <laughs> Get professional help. Counselors are gifted by God. The Bible talks about giftings and about counselors. Go get help. God has gifted them to help us through difficult times. However, in order for your hope to be solid, can I invite you connect, to connect with and commit to God. Jeremiah 17.7 7 says, reminds us, blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. Do you want hope? Make God your confidence. Make Him your anchor. Make Him foundation. Connect with Him. Feel free to ask Him why. He's a big boy. He can handle it. 
even if you have a BA, even if you have a bad attitude, <laughs> right? Reach out to him, connect with him, verbalize your heart, because like I said before, he already knows what's in there. He's waiting for you to get it out. He can handle your questions, your doubts, your insinuations, your victim mentality. If the worship band could make their way up here, we're going to, in a couple moments, end with, with a course. But listen to me. When you ask why, make sure you're listening for the answer. Okay? Because oftentimes we ask why, we think we know the answer. Well, why? Well, I'll tell you why. Cause it, no, God, no. God, 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 why? What, why what, what got skewed in my life? What, do I do? What, where, what are you trying to do, God? Give me, give me the why. And then, commit to Him. You've connected, now commit. The creator of everything, the author and finisher of our faith, the Alpha and Omega, the one who is bigger and less, he who holds all things in his hand. The ultimate and the only giver of true hope. The one who can bring certainty and assurance into your life and into mine. And as you do that, I promise you, you will begin to move from helpless to hopeful. Then you will be able to agree with the pastor with the apostle Paul when he declares in Philippians 1:6 being confident in this he who began a good work in me will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Sometimes when we talk about hope and pastors up here saying, are you full of hope? And we know we're supposed to say yes. And we're going, oh yeah, full of hope. And inside we're going, I'm scared. What about tomorrow? What about today? Nothing's going right. Sometimes in a series like this, it's, it's tough to make that confession that right now, I'm not feeling hopeful. Maybe that's you. Maybe you've curled up in the corner of your kennel. I'm going to encourage you. God's given you a button. He's given you a lever. He's given you spiritual truth. And He doesn't sit there ready to condemn you. Bring Him whatever attitude, issue, wherever you're coming from. Be honest. Be vulnerable. Be transparent. And I assure you, as I was going through my mess, my pastor one time called me up and I drove to my house and he knew I was going through. He goes, Doug, Doug, just think, just think of the story you're going to have. I said, excuse my language, to heck with the story. I just hope to make it through today. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're just hoping to make it through this service and when you get out that door, you're going, all hell's going to break loose. That's your fear. Reach out to God and know with certainty that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Great word. I appreciate it very much. Give him a round of applause for being here with us and being obedient to what the Lord has called him to do and to share his message with us. If we can have everyone stand. God is faithful. And he will complete the good work that he started in you. We can have some of the our prayer team just come up here, please. Because the Lord has spoke to some of you this morning through worship, through the message, through what Brother Doug Clark has brought. And maybe you just need to reach out and push that button or pull that lever that there's people here. This is the best place to be. The best place to be to reach out is in the house of God. So if you're here this morning and you need some prayer in regards to 
whatever situation that you might be going through. We want you just to step out in boldness and just come up here so that we can pray for you. Everybody else, if we could just have you uh, grab the hand of the person next to you. And we're going to pray and then we'll dismiss. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you for your faithfulness towards us. Lord God, that regardless of what's going on in our lives, regardless of circumstances, Lord, that we can reach out. That you have provided for us, Lord God, the solution to anything and everything that ails us. And Father, I pray for each individual here that whatever the circumstance, Lord, that they will know and understand that you are in full control and that there's people that love them and that we are truly a family and no one takes this journey alone. We thank you, Lord God, in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah.